Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Graphics Programming Virtual Meetup. We follow the Berlin Code of Conduct. We have a Discord server. Uh, we also have a Twitter that we will announce all the future meeting. And we have YouTube channel for the recording of the past meetings. Today's topic is still Viki Mini Path Tracer, but since we finished the main tutorial series, today's topic will be the extra chapters and we will cover chapter one to six. All of those chapters are relatively short, so it will not take too much time. So chapter one is Gaussian uh, filter anti-aliasing. So we are currently use a box filter where we just have a uniformly distributed uh, point in this box, which, which is probably everyone will do when we first implement a uh, pass tracer. However, there are better ways to reduce noise. And one of the ways that the tutorial uses is Gaussian filter where the idea is instead of have a uniform distribution, we have a Gaussian distribution. So kind of, we have something like that, where more points will be, in, uh, will be near the center of the box. And the code is surprisingly simple. I, I thought this code would be really hard, but the code is surprisingly simple. We just follow this called box Muller transform that you can search on Wikipedia. And after that, we have a Gaussian distribution. And to use, to use the Gaussian distribution, we, uh, when we generate this random pixel center, we call this random Gaussian function. And we have some scaling factor. Uh, so, The, the result is not as impressive as I expected. It, it is almost the same, uh, but there are minor differences like in, in, the, uh, in the boundary here, the image is slightly more blurry in the Gaussian filter version versus the box version. To, to see the Gaussian reaction, we can have we can set its radius to really large and then we get this blurry image of course we need to just set it back for for later uses and chapter four is a fun one it's about measuring the performance of our Vulkan application and i think a lot of things in this chapter can be applied directly to Jack X even CUDA too. Uh, so NVIDIA have a, have a bunch of NSAID softwares for debugging and for uh, profiling uh, graphics and as general comp uh, GPU computation softwares. And there's NSAID systems, which is uh, workload level performance analysis. And there are NSAID graphics, which you, I assume it's like a, a render doc that will capture frames and give uh, fra frame by frame performance. And also there are NSAID compute that is for CUDA. And since we are using, using Vulkan, we don't need to care about NSAID compute. And for NSAID, uh, NVIDIA suggests ways to start from NSAID system to have an overview of the, our system. And then we can dive into different frames using NSAID graphics later. Since we are use, just using a compute shooter in this tutorial, we will not talk about NSAID graphics, only NSAID system. So, after installing NSAID system, then we started, uh, it looked like this. And then we need to select uh, GPU for profiling. After, afterwards, we can have a bunch of uh, settings to set. 
in particular, we need to set the, this collect work entries toggle. Also, we, we need to just give, give the uh, give give the command of what program we want to run. So we have this work and toggle. We have we have the where our actual program is, and then we can hit start. And then uh, the profiler will just do some do its things. Uh, after, after the profiler is done, we get this uh, timeline view where we can, we can have, uh, just have a look at where our program spend time zone. And in this, pro in this program, since it's so trivial, we spend most time actually just creating device. Uh, there are also the toggle here that we can change into different views. Uh, there is a client summary that we can get some summaries. And also the files which will give us the log of the standard uh, output or the standard errors, which can be useful if, some, if something happens. And if we want to look at the timeline closely, uh, we can we can select the just right click this Vulkan API here, and then there will be option of showing showing event views, so we can click that. And that will give us an event view, which will have detailed timelines on all the Vulkan calls. And when it gets started and how much time it spent. And we can also click the sample point on the timeline view to, to see where it gets, uh, to see where, where it is to get an idea of what our program are doing at that particular point. If we want to zoom in, we can select a range of the particular, of particular interest and then we can zoom in because most of the time our programs spend on the creating, creating device and destroying device uh, but we want to know uh, more in depth about what is going on in the middle so we can zoom in. And we just right click and select that filter and zoom in button. Afterwards, we have this view. Uh, now, now it, it is kind of clear that we have a bunch of uh, queue with idle, which is we, we are waiting the GP, waiting our GPU to finish our task. And there, notice there is a big blank here that we are not doing any GPU work. So if we want to investigate that, we can we can go back to the timeline uh, go back to the event view and say what is going on at that range and we find a VK map memory and VK map memory and then we can look at the line in this in here so what we actually are doing here is writing a bunch of files no sorry just writing our output image to a file which will takes a bunch of time. So, so that, that, that way we can just uh, know where our program spend time on and we know in our program besides creating device and destroying device, we spend significant amount of time just writing to that file. 
and we can we can keep zooming to just investigate and in here we can just just say a bunch of a bunch of weight idols and and uh, i think this is this is our main computer shooter uh we also we probably also have weight idols for stuff like creating uh, uploading buffers creating uh accelerating data structures and then we can just investigate deeper and find our performance bottleneck. So actually after read this chapter, I just run this uh, inside system program on my recent project today. And I, I already found a performance bug that my fans, uh, the VK fans I use kind of, uh, just wait. Uh, we uh, just were. Well, I was waiting for the VK fans, and it's just time out for the first two frames, which we kind of delayed my startup time for two seconds. And just with this tool, I can find this bug and fix it. Really nice. Uh, the third topic is compaction. So. This is an easy thing. We just pass an additional flag when we build the uh, bottom level acceleration data structures, which called VK build acceleration data structure allow compaction bit. And that will drastically reduce the amount of memory we need to use for the acceleration data structure. It's, it works by first build the uncompact uh, data structure and then and then move memory around to have a compact one. This, uh, this, this way can be beneficial if the bottom level acceleration data structure does not change. So if we have a dynamic mesh that change every frame, we should not compact it. Otherwise, it's a very good idea to compact it to get uh, reduced memory usage. And then the chapter four talks about have uh, including files uh, that match values between CPAPA and DSL. So we have a bunch of uh, magic, magic numbers that in the CPAPA side and in the GSL side that are the same. So the idea is we can have a header file that we just put those numbers here and we can use them both in the GSL and in CPAPAS. And in the, in the CPAPAS side, we change a bunch of constants to just directly include that header. And also we just need to change all the usage of those constants to the names because we change the uh, constant name into the macros, uh, screaming case name, so we need to change those names. And for the descriptor sets, add, add bindings, we will do the similar kind of things. Instead of magic numbers, we use the bindings. Uh, similar thing for write descriptor sets, add, and for the VK command dispatch and for writing uh, uh, to the image. And for the, for the GSL side, it, it is very similar. We need to enable this, this uh, extension called GL Google include directive that we enable this feature. After, afterwards, we can just include files like, like in C or in C++. Because GSL does not support include by default, and afterward, afterwards we can just use this constant in GSL. And the next chapter talks about push constants. So, so push constants is some kind of data 
that is small enough that we can directly push into the GPU in a command. Uh, so, so with push constant, we can circumvent all the defining descriptor sets, layout, descriptor sets, uh, kind of stuff, and, and creating buffers. Instead, we just, for every invocation, we push some small constants for, uh, to, the, to the command buffer, and then the GPU can directly use it. For push constants, we can define some kind of struct because this struct is both CPU side uh, and GPU side. We put them into this common, put this common header file. And also we have this uh, include guard to, to say we do stuff a little bit differently in C++ and also in the GSL. Uh, does anyone know if there are a similar include guard for C? So how do, if I'm using C, how do I know if there's include guard? Because I, I don't know. I know if define C++, but I don't know the C equivalent. How, just how to distinguish GRSL and C. Uh, no one else? Okay, I will continue. So, so another thing is GRSL structs are packed by the STD140 storage layout by default, which is different from the layout rules of C or C++. Uh, so be careful with just sharing structs between GRSL and C++. Rule of thumb is don't never put a VEX3 in here, otherwise you're in, probably in trouble. Uh, just always use VEX4 and then trying to give the W dimension some purpose. And with, with that, we can use the push constant in the GRSL side with layout push constants. And uh, then with, uh, with that, we can just use the push constant in the, uh, in the code we want. And in this case, it's resolution because we want to have a runtime decided resolution on the CPU side. So we don't need to recompile the code every time we change the resolution. And and in the Vulkan side, first we need to have, uh, have uh, structs that store the push constant data. And, the, and then, when, then when we want to do push constants, we need to give the pipeline layout a push, push constant range. We can give pipe, uh, pipeline layout multiple push constant range. That's why uh, this number and also an array has push constant range array. And this is a common pattern of passing a range of stuff in Vulkan. And what, what we will do here is just passing one push constant range and then the range is uh, uh, reference to the variable. No equivalent in C, just use a dash else. Uh, now this is a problem of, I, I don't know if in C how to do this kind of stuff by just say, I want to, to behave differently in C and GSL. I'm, I'm just curious. Not, not like I ever read this in C though. Uh, so I'm just curious. Also, there are better solutions uh, like Sphere V Reflect compared to that include way. Uh, and then for the, 
for the command dispatch, we before the dispatch, we need to also uh, push our push constant. So we need to first have a VK command push constants that needs a pipeline layout, needs a shooter stage, and they also need this size or uh, size of the push constant and the and the address. So with that, we have push constant and we can have images with runtime beside uh, dimensions. And chapter six is for more samples. So we cannot arbitrarily add more samples to our current program because Windows have this timeout detection and recovery mechanism that we kick in if a single GPU computation takes too long. Also, also even on Linux, which such thing doesn't exist, it's probably not a good idea to just freeze up the GPU and then let user feel like their computer just died. So the solution is to break, the, break up the command buffer into smaller ones and accumulate the result. So, so for that, we add another variable that for each batch, we have an index for that batch as a push constant. We then for the for the uh, RNG, we need to put that in the index of batch into consideration. Otherwise, we are just doing the same calculation over and over again with the same initial seed. And and then we what we need to do is we will. We will read the previous status of our image buffer, and then we will scale scale it by the, by the how, how much batches we already have. So after, afterwards, afterwards we will have uh, we will have uh, accumulated result of uh, accumulated result of all the previous all the previous. Uh, pixel color, color just added without this uh, division. And then, and then we will just average the pixel color. Uh, we will add the average pixel color of this invocation. After all this, we divide back by the batch size pl uh, plus one. So, uh, this, this this way we we can just rescale and then divide uh, divide back and to to get the correct accumulated results in each computer shooter invocation. Uh, currently, we just run the command buffer. We just create a command buffer and submit it wait it to complete and end. But instead, we if we want to have multiple batches, we need a for loop. So initially, it's the same. We just have, inside the for loop, we allocate the command buffer. Then we bind the pipeline, create a descriptor sets. Uh, also change the sample batch of our push constant struct into the batch index we want. And then we can push constant and then do our dispatch. Now, now it's a thing I am not totally understand about this memory barrier. So, so the tutorial makes this memory barrier when we have our last batch and we will just create we will just wait for wait for this barrier 
Uh, I am not sure why we didn't need this barrier before, but I certainly need it now. Does anyone can answer this question for me? Uh, does anyone know why we need a memory barrier here? Uh, no idea. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I I guess it's just I am still not totally clear about vocal signalization stuff, but and. Afterwards, this afterwards this tutorial uh, just m submit weight and tree, which, if you remember from the previous series, it, it what it does is it will end the command buffer recording, make device wait idle for that queue, and uh, well submit first and then wait idle for that queue and then free the command buffer which I think is a really bad helper function because it does two things. Well, it does four things, and I don't think it should be a helper function this way, but that's what tutorial, this tutorial used. And then we get, uh, we get this nice result where uh, we have 32 batches and accumulate them together. Um, are you sure we didn't have the barrier before? Because I'm looking at the chapter 12, the anti-aliasing source code from the actual shader, and I'm seeing the same uh, shader, write, host, read, pipeline stage, compute, pipeline stage, host bit, barrier. Uh, okay, maybe the barrier was there before. Uh, yeah, and they just modified it somehow. Yeah. Me, yeah, me, probably you're right. Two, I need to. Oh, okay. That the if statement is confusing because it's running in a for loop. Yeah. Um, so and it only needs to do that on the very last one. Yeah. Um, because that's that's a GPU to CPU, right? Not a um, GPU to GPU, yeah. which is uh, handled just by and beginning and ending the command buffers. Yeah. So. It's it's uh, more like they took the code that did all the command buffer recording and then pulled it into a for loop, whereas before it was just allocate once and then submit. Now it's at the start of for loop and then allocate, submit, allocate, submit. Yeah, um, yeah, it's the same kind of things. So it's kind of like a um, uh, end condition, was it? Yeah. Do you think it's a good idea for this for loop to like just have a dedicated command pool and then always allocate from that pool and immediately like reset that pool? Uh, I don't think it matters. <laughs> the the co the cost of this binding co of, the, of this command buffer recording is going to be peanuts compared to the actual ray tracing time spent. Yeah. So if you did it 32 times, yeah, it'd be 32. Uh, but on the GPU, you're doing it 32 million or some other crazy number large. So yeah. um, I, it, you could uber try hard this part, but I don't think it really would make a difference. <laughs> okay. Uh... 
Any other thoughts before we end the recording? Okay, uh, thank you, and I will end the recording.